Hello, and welcome back to the Puck and Roll podcast. Well, sort of. Uh, this isn't one of the regular episodes that you may be used to by now, um, as you may well notice due to the lack of uploading recently. Um, but there are reasons for that. You know, um, life gets in the way sometimes, and uh, be it schoolwork, personal stuff, whatever it may be, uh, <laughs> it doesn't always go as planned, and uh, we just needed to take a little bit of a break uh, from the regular podcasting, um, but I was thinking of a little alternative just to give you listeners some content, and uh, something that is uh, that very doable for me is just talking about prospects, because it's kind of what I do, and I've been watching a lot of hockey. Um, that was a lot more enjoyable than watching the Habs recently. And while I'm not really going to go into detail on the way the Habs have been playing, I'm just, look, I'm just going to say that seeing the news today that Sammy Niku might not be in the lineup, um, that was kind of heartbreaking considering he's been by far the Habs' best defenseman since he's gotten into the lineup. And I thought Chris Weidman was the best defenseman before that. Um... And the fact that they can't have both players in the lineup at the same time is really frustrating for me. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's it's been that kind of season, right? Like we had our big high in the playoffs and now it looks like our season's um, not gonna end with any playoff time. And um, I know we've discussed that at length uh, going into the season on this podcast of like predictions and stuff and... Uh, mine switched from, like, August to end of September, early October, because I just didn't see it with this lineup, and the chemistry hasn't been there. They've been underperforming even their terrible expected goal metric. Um, everything has been bad, but the Habs being bad means a potential very good draft pick and that's what we're going to focus on today we're going to try to be a little bit optimistic uh or i guess just seeing the silver lining in all of this and that's just seeing what kind of player the habs could get if they end up with a top 10 selection the nightmare is that they end up with the 11th overall pick which will then get transferred to the arizona coyotes from the christian dvorak trade and that the Habs would only have the first round pick of the Carolina Hurricanes, which is likely going to be um, not a very high selection based off of their start to the season, which has been tremendous. Um, but yeah, let's let's just take a look at some of the players at the top end of the draft to start this off. And I guess we'll just see where it goes. I might ramble into players that are obviously not going to go in the first round, but we'll we'll see we'll, we'll we'll think about that once we get there we'll focus on uh just this oh and by the way if you are watching this on youtube this is my face you may not have seen it before i'm sebastian hi i'm half of the prospect heroes but uh yeah hello and uh let's just get straight into this so obviously the the, the player that ev or all habs fans that want to tank are vying for is uh Shane Wright. Like, this is a player who played in the OHL with exceptional status and dominated the league doing so, uh, scoring, I believe, 39 goals as a rookie. Uh, but I am just going to double check that because he is just a really, really good player. And, um, but at the same time, there are question marks that have kind of arisen this season. So Shane Wright is a six foot one centerman. 187 pounds, right shot. So the Habs already have quite a few right shot, well, quite a few. They already have Nick Suzuki as a right shot centerman, uh, and Jake Evans is, is right shot as well. Um, but yeah, so Shane Wright, in his rookie season as a 15, 16 year old in the OHL playing with the Kingston Frontenacs, scored 39 goals and 66 points in 58 games which is a ridiculous tally. And he, he did that as already the assistant captain as a 15 year old. Like that is unheard of base. I mean, in, in, at least to my knowledge. So he, he led, he led the entire team in points as a 15 year old second top uh, point producer and goal scorer was Zade wisdom, who is a very fun prospect as well in the flyer system. 
And so Shane Wright is, he's a difficult player to describe for me just based off of what I've seen this season, comparing that to what he was before the pandemic. So this season, okay, before the pandemic, terrific goal scorer. Like, like he's a sniper. Like, his shot is amazing. But high-end hockey IQ, extremely intelligent, hardworking, very sm smart playmaker, um, and is very manipulative in uh, not just... Not just like when, while handling the puck, but in his, in his off in his off puck movement as well, he can, he can get lost in coverage, which is very important for a sniper because you want to actually get an opportunity to fire off your shot if you have a great shot, which Shane Wright does. This season, um, and at the it, it has to be noted that Shane Wright has basically not played in eighteen months. He had one tournament with Team Canada, but he was like injured or like he he was not fully healthy for that tournament at all. So he's not. Like before this season, at least before these seven first uh, first eight games of the season, he has not played healthy since March of 2020, and especially for a player as young as these kids going into the draft for the first time, that is a huge effect. And Shane Wright has been more affected than, I mean, as an OHL player than basically anyone else at the top end of the draft, um, except for for. Uh, Maybe Ty Nelson, who another OHL player who's been great in North Bay to start the season, no rust whatsoever. But Shane Wright has been showing that rust, and he, uh, yeah, it's been it's it's been a bit tough to watch. I went I went to a, a game and watched him live uh, when he was playing the Ottawa Sixty Sevens in Ottawa, uh, a game which Kingston lost three to two. He scored a goal, like he, he scored Kingston's first goal of the game, and it was a bit of a fun goal because. Like, I was just expecting if, if he scored, it's going to be a snipe. It's going to be power play, one-timer, or off the rush, top corner, right? Like, sniper's goal. But it wasn't, which is almost promising in a way, because we know he can snipe. Like, like everyone already knows that. And But this goal that he scored was uh, a gritty goal of he went to the front of the net uh, and... Puck got, gets to him, he whacks at it, it's saved, and then while falling down, he whacks at it again, and it goes in. And it was a really nice goal to see, because he showed some diversity as a player, which I like. Um, and he also showed bright spots, like in transition, very manipulative, and uh, he has a gravitational force, like drawing everyone towards himself, and then making the smart play of bringing it, of like passing it to a line mate, who, and then they have an odd man rush. Like, very intelligent player, and aware of what advantages his skill can bring in elevating his teammates as well. And I like that. At the same time, the Shane Wright of this season has been a good player. He's not been the Shane Wright that people have expected and that people saw t like a year and a half ago, two years ago. Uh, eight points in eight games is a very slow start for a projected first overall pick, especially in a league, I mean, in, in the OHL and the CHL, you, like you, as a first overall pick, as a sniper, as a high octane offensive player, you need to be scoring more than a point a game. Uh, I mean, just just look at someone like I don't know. Um, yeah, Matthew Savoy. Uh, he's, he's had a great start to the season with Winnipeg. It's a it's a powerhouse team, which Kingston is not, but the very very productive offensively. And Shane Wright just hasn't been that just yet. Um, I, I've seen him, I guess, just drifting a lot, not being as implicated as um, he was in the past. Like, he, he kind of waits for the puck to get to him for him to do something with it sometimes, and I don't I don't know if it's like a conditioning thing, if he's playing with an injury, if it's just rust, but whatever it is, it's not what you'd expect from a franchise player, and... Like, Shane Wright probably was never going to be generational talent, but franchise talent, like, franchise-defining, like, top 20 player in the league, I thought, but, I mean, many people thought was totally achievable for him, and he hasn't quite shown that this season yet. Still, only eight games. It's a long season. It's, it could just be a slow start, and I don't think anyone should make any definitive uh, statements about him until, like, the new year, but, um... It doesn't necessarily scream first overall pick, what we've seen this season, right? Like, we saw 
two years ago did, but this season hasn't quite done that just yet. Uh, and part of the reason that doesn't scream first overall pick is just the strength of the rest of the class, because it's a very strong draft class. Like, not, I, I, I don't think it's the strongest class of, like, the last decade or anything, but it's, especially in contrast to last year's draft class, this is a very, very strong one. And Matthew Savoy, this is a player who is a five foot nine centerman, and usually those kind of players slip in the draft. Um, and he might, right? Like, like I, I would, I would not be shocked if, um, if Morgan, not Morgan, if Connor Geeky uh, goes before Savoy. They're they're both teammates with the Winnipeg Ice, and Connor Geeky is this six foot four centerman. Uh, and while that sounds massive, he doesn't really use his size. Um, he's just a very creative playmaker and very fun to watch. He's a great skater. Um, I think there's a big gap between him and Savoy. Like I'm, I think Geeky might end up like in my rankings if he continues his play. He'll probably be between ten and fifteen, whereas Savoy's gonna be top three. Um, and he is just so dynamic, like hugely dynamic. He takes control of the game. He uh, is a an extremely fast and mobile skater and explosive as anything. Like he gets shot out of a cannon, and he can really like he can change his own pace, which makes his speed so much more effective because he's not just always going at 100 percent like you can manipulate defenders by changing that pace and he does that um and again another right shot centerman and he is like six goals 17 points and 13 games for winnipeg winnipeg I, i'm not wait, have they been they lost a game okay winnipeg uh, they started the season uh 11 and 0 then they Finally lost a game against the Edmonton Oil Kings, another powerhouse team, and then they won their last game again. But um, it has to be noted, it's a very, very strong team, which will inflate point totals and uh, will maybe make players less susceptible to being exploited defensively. But if you watch this player play, it's tremendous. Like, I, I don't, I don't. He's really fun, and I think that, like, he could challenge for the first overall spot. If if his play continues as it's going right now, I think, like, you could convince me, if the draft were held right now, you could convince me to pick Savoy over uh, Shane Wright. And I think that is pretty exciting almost for the draft class because it makes things more interesting not having that consensus first overall pick because there's more at stake right like for instance if you're picking second overall there's a chance that even if you think that Shane Wright is by far the best player in the draft there's a chance that you get him and that excitement I think is part of the reason I find Scanny so fun and um other players that I think are really fun let's let's take a look here um Okay, so we have to talk about the two players that play for uh, uh, JYP in Finland, um, which is Brad Lambert and um, Joachim Kamel. This is an interesting one, because Lambert is still ranked more highly by basically every network than Kamel. But if you look at their actual stats... I believe Brad Lambert, unless this has changed, he only has two points in 10, no, in like 13 games, a goal and assist, but I will double check that. Um, and while Joaquin Kamel is lighting the league on fire. Um, so Brad Lambert, a goal and an assist in 13 games. So in terms of just a production standpoint, which is so far from the entire story, this is underwhelming. Like, like the Liga is not quite like the SHL in terms of quality of play. Young players can take hold of this league, which Kamel has. Uh, Kamel has been scoring at an absurd rate. Um, I believe he's still leading the league in both goals and points as a 17-year-old who only turns 18 in April, end of April, 
And yeah, so 12 goals, 18 points in 16 games, which is ridiculous. It's it's absurd. But you have to also look into how these points and goals are coming. So with Kamel, he scored almost a handful of goals that are just kind of lob shots from the point. Um, he, he's either he's a right winger, but like just circling around the offensive zone and then lobbing in a shot and it just makes its way through and goes in, right? Like, this is not a type of goal that gets scored in the NHL. It's not projectable. Um, and that has to be noted. At the same time, whenever I've watched this team play, which has been on four occasions thus far, Kamel has impressed me in every facet of the game. Like... Not just goal scoring, in his playmaking, in his movement, in his intelligence, in his defensive play, his play in transition, in offensive transition. Defensive transition, I haven't seen much yet, but in offensive transition, he's been solid. Um, not as good as Brad Lambert in transition. Like, Brad Lambert is a, almost like Matthew Savoy in transition of... He's a phenomenal skater, takes really smart routes of getting the puck into the offensive zone. He uh, has zone entries at a ridiculously high rate, uh, especially for a teenager in the Liga. He's doing great in that facet. And uh, like other scouts have been talking about this, of while Kamel has been overperforming his metrics or his expected goals or whatever it may be, his... What they, like he's been overperforming in his stat line compared to what his project, well, what his play would, would um, I guess, uh, prompt. But uh, Lambert just has gotten so ridiculously unlucky. Like he, he's been hitting posts. He's been um, like getting great, like forcing goalies to make ridiculous saves on him, and he's a very very good player. Like when when you when you watch the team, like. Brad Lambert is by no means a player that should only have two points in 13 games. This is a dynamic offensive player who gets power play time on the second unit. Uh, Both players play in the same spot on the power play. They're both right shots, and they play at the top of the left circle as a one-timer option, which Kamel really is a one-timer option. Brad Lambert, um, primarily a playmaker, uh, but he can shoot. Right, like I, I, I've seen him get some good shots off uh, from that spot, and it's 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 really interesting because you just see people talking about these two guys and comparing them because you naturally do when they're on the same team and they're both projected to be top ten picks. And on the one hand, you have the guy that's projected more highly and has been for a long time. On the other hand, you have the guy that is whose production is literally eight times as much. Like, no, nine times as much. Like, how do you compare them? Like, it's it's so interesting because I've seen a lot of people saying, yes, like, like Kamel has been outproducing Lambert a lot, but Lambert's been playing better, and it's more projectable, it, higher ceiling, which doesn't entirely correspond to what I'm seeing. I'm I'm seeing Joaquin Kamel as a player who is highly involved in the entire game. In uh, a game I watched between uh, JYP and TPS, which is uh, the same the, the, the team that Uriah Slavkovsky plays for, uh, who I'll get to in a minute, um, Kamel was the most noticeable noticeable player on the entire ice. And I only started watching after he scored his goal, uh, which was on a nice one-timer um, on the power play. And his shot, like, like Kamel's shot is ridiculous. Like, like he's a very, very good shot. And he knows how to use it. And he knows how to use it in a pro league, which says a lot. But I was just constantly watching him on the ice. And I really love the way he plays. Like he he gets involved in the defensive zone Um with and without the puck, so with the puck, uh, I think he make like. And what what I've seen so far, he's making very good decisions in how to get the puck up the ice, whether it be carrying it himself, which isn't his biggest strength, it should be noted, um, or if it's uh, about going one way and then a nice pass to a teammate, leaving a big opening to get into the offensive zone. Uh, I just I've seen him make a couple of very nice breakout passes. 
I've liked what I've seen of him in transition. In the defensive zone, I thought that he's been solid. Like, better than you'd expect, like, significantly better than you'd expect a 17-year-old sniper in a pro league to be. I, I don't think he's been a liability in any way, uh, and it's been impressive. I, I think he's outperformed um, uh, Brad Lambert in the defensive zone. And though it should be noted as well, Brad Lambert is playing at center, and his responsibilities in the in the defensive zone are way more complex and bigger than uh, than Kamel's. But I I really really like Kamel so far, and I know he he's becoming a favorite of um, people like oh, not scouts but hockey fans that are just kind of stat watching rather than watching the games because his production is ridiculous. Like he he he's on pace to shatter records as a U-20 player, I think, in the Liga. Like, he's he's doing ridiculously well. And at the same time, of course, you have some backlash of the actual scouting community saying, well, actually, if you watch, he's not that, necessarily. He's really overperforming, but what I've seen... Like, he, no, he, he shouldn't have 12 goals in 16 games, but... 8 goals in 16 games, scoring a goal every 2 games in the Liga... I think that corresponds to how he's been playing when I've watched, and I think he should probably have more assists than his six. I think that his playmaking is underrated, and his puck movement, and um, like I, what I really like as well is just how he moves the puck in the offensive zone, and not necessarily as a distributor, but as like skating around, and he has that elusiveness and um, manipulative ability that makes him look a lot faster than he is he's not the fastest player but he can keep he can hold on to the puck for a long time in the offensive zone kind of circling around and opening up spaces for teammates so he might just like then like at, after circling leave the puck for like a teammate who's like at the point or something but then he'll have created a massive hole in coverage for a teammate to get into to get a pass from that defenseman and then uh, get a dangerous scoring opportunity and I've liked that a lot and I think Brad Lambert has that dynamic ability and and more um but I don't I don't know from what I've seen so far Kamel is the player that I would that he, he's, he's he's currently my number two uh, three after Savoy and Shane Wright I I like him a lot uh I think Brian Brad Lambert would be my four I haven't gotten a chance to watch uh Logan Cooley yet and I think that might shake some things up um about like Uriah Slavkovsky he's really interesting I I I only watched that one game of him so my sample might be completely skewed and what I'm saying might make absolutely no sense but I've liked him in that He's this massive, like, he's six foot six. I think he's six six. I'm gonna double check that just to make sure. Um, yeah, six foot four, but 225 pounds as a left winger. Like, this is a mat, it's a unit of a player. He's huge. And what I like is that his playmaking is really quite impressive. Um, I was expecting him to be a goal scorer, uh, because. I went into the game not really knowing much about him at all. Uh, I I hadn't even really visited his elite prospects page uh, and looked at his stats in the past. And but yeah, like he he's a he, he's a playmaker. He, he has three assists in twelve games for TPS. Uh, and one of those came in the game that I watched, which was on the power play. He was uh playing below the goal line, and just a nice simple play of. Uh, he got past the puck, he uh, just tapped it to the bumper, and bumper bump one times it, and he scores. But his movement of getting into that, that position and eluding coverage was really great. Uh, he has some flair of getting some really nice passes off, off the rush. Um, he's, been, he's been really interesting. I, I, I don't know from what I've seen so far if I'd take him in the top 10, but he's been, he's a really, he's a player that I'm looking forward to tracking more this season. And I think he's going to go. He's going to get drafted more highly than I would be comfortable taking him because of that size and the NHL always overvalues size, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, he's he's really something else. And um, yeah, I again, I, I don't have all, all that much to say about him other than he's fun, and I'm looking forward to watching him some more. Um, 
what are some, some other players that are going to go high that I've watched? Um, okay, we, we kind of got... I think we're done with like the, the high-level players that I've watched because I, I, I have been unable to watch anything of Danila Yurov. I tried in a KHL game. He got zero minutes on ice, so that was a waste of a game um, <laughs> because I don't have access to Instat and... I just watched it live and it didn't didn't turn out. Um, so that was unfortunate, even though it makes sense in the KHL, I think, for a 17-year-old, because it's such a highly competitive league. It makes sense that he's not getting that ice time. But um, and then for uh, Mirosh Nashenko, I haven't I haven't watched him yet. So I, I can't I can't talk about them or any of the US NTDP guys because it's a ridiculously long list of players there that uh, I really need to watch. How many do I have from, from that team? I have 11 players that I want to, that, that are draft eligible this year that I wanted to look at from that team. Logan Cooley, Rutger McGrory, Ryan Chesley, Tyler Duke, Cruz Lucius, Lane Hudson, Frank Nazar, Isaac Howard, Seamus Casey, uh, Devin Kaplan, and Cole Spicer. Like, that's ridiculous. Like, anyways, I'm... I'm I, it, I have my work cut out for me just for that one team, but yeah, I think I think I'll just talk about a couple players that I've liked that aren't going to go in the top end of the draft that aren't potential targets for a Hab selection in that range with the pick that's likely going to be very high this season. Um, so Patrick Lorty and I, uh, we went to a. A game of the Gatineau Olympic a couple weeks ago with media passes, which is still ridiculous. Like I, I, I haven't wrapped my head around having access to a media pass yet. But um, as a result of that, I've been I've been watching quite a bit of Gatineau. Uh, just the one game live thus far. That's that's going to change very quickly. Um, but I've watched a couple of streams. I think I'm at four games now that I've watched of them. Like I complete games um, and. Noah Warren, oh my god, this player. This is a guy that is not someone that I thought I would adore. He's a typical, like, NHL GM dream draft pick of six foot five, hulking defenseman, but with a very smooth skater. Like, this is a dream player for an NHL GM. Oh, and he's a defensive specialist on top of that. Like, this is like... Cons- not not conservative, but, but like old fashioned sc- NHL scout favorite, which is just not what I am. Like I, I'm in this new generation of scouts that likes more progressive things, like value and transition, and looking at analytics and all these different things. But this is a player I've every time I've watched Gatno, yeah, he's impressed me more. Like, because like in the end, I don't care if 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 a player. Well, for the most part, I don't care if a player is six foot five or five foot five, as long as they're good. Like if you're good at hockey, I like you. <laughs> like that's kind of how I um, how I watch it. Uh, and then with the asterisk of um, if you if you're not a shitty person on top of that, but we'll, we're not we're not getting into that right now. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Tony D'Angelo. Anyways, um, so yeah, so Noah Warren is this massive defenseman, and he's... So the QMJHL, for those who don't know, is a league that um, is full of of highly skilled forwards and a lack of defensive system in basically any team. Like, the defense is kind of just... They're up, up in the air and just hit and hope with defensive play, um, completely inconsistent. Sometimes defensemen play well, sometimes they don't but there's no consistency in the systems. It's, anyways, it's the cue. <laughs> it's just the cue. So when a player plays an extremely effective and smart defensive game consistently, that sticks out. And Noah Warren does that. He is this, again, massive player. He wins every physical battle he gets into. He's also young for the draft class. This is a guy who is born in July, mid-July. So this is a very young player for the draft class. And he wins everything. Every single puck battle, physical battle, whatever, he wins it consistently. And he uses his body really intelligently to put some distance between opposing players and the puck, uh, like separating them from the puck. And his, 
I've really liked his gap control. I think that he's he, he's a good enough skater where if there's a guy on a breakaway, he has the skating sp- speed and just the length of limbs to catch up and whack the puck away. And he's just very, very smart defensively. Um, I think he makes ver- the, the good, simple play in, in the breakout pass or just in regaining control of the puck. So if the puck's behind the net, puck battle... Or if he gets there first and then there's a four-checker coming behind him, he knows it. He's very aware. He's, he has great spatial awareness. And he just makes a simple pass to his defensive partner and it, we're all fine and dandy and it goes the other way. It's very effective. It's fun to watch. And he has just been really good whenever I've watched him. He's also, again, good enough skater. He can bring the puck up the ice himself. He doesn't do it consistently. Uh, I'd like him to do it because he has the skill. He has the ability. And, again, just really fun player. I, I've liked him a lot. He, he's he been so good that he's been elevated to the second power play unit from getting no power play time at all. Uh, and he has a, a good shot. Like, like I, he had a great slap shot goal off the rush on the power play. He got a feed from Samuel Savoie against Sherbrooke. And that was the game-winning goal, which made me very happy. Um, but in the game that Patrick and I went to, he had two primary assists on the power play. Uh, one of them was phenomenal because you, you saw he was itching to take a shot and he finally got the puck the second they're taking down the power play and he really wanted to shoot but he saw an option right in front of the net of just uh, uh, his teammate that got a stick free a stick on the ice perfect like slap pass onto the stick and just tap in goal it was gorgeous um, I think there's some offensive upside there I've liked him a lot more than uh, Tristan Luneau so far. Um, I don't think Luneau's been bad. I just don't think... He just he hasn't stood out to me. And for a player that's projected in the first round, you have to stand out, especially in the QMJHL or the CHL, junior hockey as a whole. You have to stand out. You can't... It's not like if you're in the SHL and you, and you don't stand out positively or negatively that it's like indicative of playing very well. This is... The opposite. You have to stand out, kind of. Because if you don't have a standout ability in junior hockey, what are you going to be in the NHL? Like, like, no one's an all-rounder, like, in the NHL that can do everything. You need something to hold on to. Like, for instance, with the Habs, like, Brett Kulak, it's it's his skating, it's his ability in transition and having a smart stick in the defensive zone. Like, or, or Sammy Niku, offensive ability, right? That... That, that dynamism in the offensive zone and passing ability. Like, especially for those, like, players that aren't those stars, like, very few players can do everything. Like, Victor Hedman can do everything, but, I, I, like, no one's banging the table and saying that Tristan Luneau is Victor Hedman because he's not. No defenseman really is. Um, but, like, you need something to really stick out. And I just, with Luneau, the, the thing that, at, 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 that does stick out is very dynamic when he gains speed and is carrying the puck through the neutral zone. That's one thing. That's one thing. He needs more. And um, I'm really hoping that more does come and show itself it, like later in the season. Maybe he's battling injuries. I have no idea. But I've, like, Noah Ward has stood out to me positively every time I've watched him in every facet of the game. Like, literally every facet of the game of not just being good at everything, he's been great at, like, basically everything he tries, he he succeeds at, and it's wonderful to watch, and he's fun. Another defenseman on Gatineau who has been Warren's partner for quite a few of the games I've watched that I've loved, and this is an overager, this is Olivier Boutin, five foot nine left shot defenseman, and he went undrafted last year. He's probably not going to get drafted this year, even though I really think he should be. Um... But this is a guy who is supremely intelligent and effective in the defensive zone. He is Gatineau's primary penalty killer as a five foot nine, eighteen year old, which is not common uh, in the queue or any league for that matter. And just very, very intelligent. He knows his capabilities. Uh, he knows the, those limitations, and that makes him far more effective because he's not trying things that he can't succeed at. He's a decent skater. He makes the constantly the smart pass in transition. It's often the simple one, but it's always the right one. 
He makes some nice stretch passes, but rarely because they they rarely have a high level of su- uh, chances of success of success. But I've loved him as well. Every time I wa- I've watched Gatineau, he's he's just been very subtly excellent. And him and Noah Warren, especially when they play together, like uh, sometimes they, like, like when they play together, they're usually the second pairing, but they're by far the best pairing like and it's not it's not close like i'm not a big fan of isaac Belivu. i think that all three of the defensemen i've covered so far of uh gatineau i've been have outplayed uh isaac Belivu. um but yeah gatineau's gatineau's a fun team i, I i've been enjoying it and the last guy i want to talk about is anthony Vero, who is this very 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 small forward who just is like highly skilled but inconsistent and it's it's really interesting because he shows these flashes of absolute brilliance and these shifts where he takes control in like a Jonathan Drouin-esque fashion when he was with the Mooseheads like just highly 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 skilled when he wants to be or when he when he can really take control um but because of how small he is which is five foot eight hundred and sixty two hundred 163 pounds like he he gets he loses every puck battle it's the opposite of Noah Warren in that in that regard and yeah it's it's something but yeah and and I just wanted to then I guess end all of this with just talking about some of the Habs prospects that I've been playing considering this is a Habs podcast I I should probably address that too um so Riley Kidney uh this is a guy that I've said many times on this podcast that is not the person that I would have picked in that slot. I would have gone for Stanislav Fozil or Simon Robertson or even Ayrton Martino um, uh, or Brent Johnson. The list goes on. I, I would have picked a lot of players, even players that went undrafted ahead of Riley Kidney in that slot. But um, his start to the season has been very, very good from a production standpoint. He's been... Uh, like, I think he's, like, ninth in the queue or eighth in the queue in uh, points, which is solid. He's played more games than a lot of the people around him, but solid. Um, but the issue with him is is it, it continues to... It, it's improving, but the big issue is still he doesn't attack the metal enough. He really doesn't. He He's a perimeter player. He can take the puck and, like, circle around the offensive zone over and over and over again. But unlike someone like Joachim Kamel... He doesn't exploit the space he creates. He doesn't cut into the middle. He, It's such a perimeter type of mentality, and he's not challenging that like entrenched mentality in himself enough. Um, and, yeah, I, I, I question how translatable that is to pro hockey. He, he, he's definitely a skilled junior player. I just I have a lot of question marks there. Um, but a player I have less question marks about, even though the, de- the development path is pretty long, is uh, Joshua Roy, who uh, is, I think, third, tied for third in the league in, in, in points. Uh, he's been tremendous for Sherbrooke. Um, like, he's specifically a power play specialist when I've watched. Uh, he's not the biggest factor at 5-on-5, five five, though his effort levels and uh, defensive positioning and overall conditioning are far improved from last season. On the power play, he's a, he's the trigger man on that power play unit, and he's very, very good doing it in his movement, in his puck movement, uh, just overall very effective. And I can, I can, unlike with Kidney, I can see what Joshua Roy can be in the NHL. Think like a Mike Hoffman light of power play specialist. Put him on like your third or fourth line at even strength, and he'll be fine. Like he won't, he won't be like... He's not. He's not gonna be bad in that situation, but he's not gonna. He's not gonna. Uh, I guess be the most impressive player out there. But on the power play, he's really smart on the, with the man advantage, and uh, he has a great shot. I like him. I. 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 I think that as a fourth round, no, fifth round pick, that was a really smart swing for the Canadians because this is a this is a guy who has definitely has has like flaws as a player. Every player does, but like quite clear flaws as a player um just in terms of even strength impact from what i've seen so far this season which was also the case last season but yeah on the power play he's a he's a beast 
He really, really is. And uh, some other Habs players, let's see, Sean Farrell played his first two games of collegiate hockey in, it has to be noted, a weak division of the NCAA. Like, Ivy League is not uh, the strongest division. Like, it's not, it's, not, it's not like Hockey East or the Big Ten, where it's very competitive and a lot of, like, very good players play there. It's, it's, it's Ivy League. It's, 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 so, it's, it's, it's easier. And his seven points in two games, they demonstrate that, right? Like, he, this is not a typical, like, freshman uh, college player, uh, considering he is, like, what, almost 20 years old? Is, is he already 20? I think he may be. Um... But he he's pretty old to be in his first year of college. But he this I've always loved Sean Farrell. I, I had him ranked at thirty six, I believe, um, in when he was drafted, and the Habs got him at one twenty four. So like that's that's tremendous. And I um, yeah, I I've always loved him, though. It's so impressive how his shot has progressed. Like when, in his draft year, he was like this really high-end borderline elite playmaker but like his shot was a bit of a muffin <laughs> like it, it, it wasn't it wasn't the best uh last year he became a, a real one-timer option the power play and then now like his, his shot like he scored two goals last night for harvard and uh both of them were one-timers both of them were one-timer slap shots like it's great. I, I'm so happy to see it because he's becoming diverse and that shooting um, threat is also really opening up his playmaking options and especially on the power play. And this is a guy like seriously second line winger. I'm I'm still seeing that. I uh, I've seen it ever since draft day. I, like I'm seeing a, 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 him developing into a second line winger. I love him. Uh, really, probably one of my absolute favorites in the Hab system. Uh, this is, like, in the last two years, I've done, like, uh, a list of, of players that I would have picked in the Habs draft slot. Um, the uh, Of those 17 draft picks uh, that, that I picked in, in the Habs stead, the only player that actually correlated to a, a Habs pick was Sean Farrell. And I picked him earlier than the Habs got him. Like I, I picked him with the with the pick that ended up being Jack Smith. Um, and yeah, I I love him so much. He's he's been great. Um, I've also watched a little bit of uh, of Daniil Sobolev. Haven't been blown away by him. Uh, this is a fourth round pick for the Habs um, in in the last draft. Um, he's playing for Windsor in, in the OHL. Um, he's been okay. Uh, I was more impressed with him from what I saw as a D minus one, which was I think like two, three games of him, uh, where he was a very aggressive defenseman. And this game that I watched, which was against uh, the Guelph Storm, wasn't his best. I don't think. Um, like he had some shaky moments, and yeah, but it was one game. Who knows? Uh, and he's still one of the players I actually kind of I, I liked from the Habs draft class. Like I liked him more than a lot of the other picks. So a lot of time for that for that to to correct itself. Um, speaking of the Guelph Storm, Danny Jilkin, who is a draft eligible player this year, ooh, this guy, this guy is really fun. I don't know if he's going to be a first rounder, but he is he is kind of the the. I guess, like, a centerpiece of that offensive core, which is really impressive considering that Sasha Pasajov is on that team. This is a guy that many had going in the first round of last year's draft. Um, so he's a year older, and he ended up being, like, the 66th overall pick. He was the third rounder for Anaheim. He should never have fallen that far because he's a great shooter. Um, a lot of holes in his game elsewhere, but he's a great shooter. Um, but, yeah, Denny Jelkin is the most important cog in the wheel that is the Guelph Storm offense and everything goes around him whether it be at even strength or on the power play he is that centerpiece and I haven't seen too many people talking about him as a potential first rounder and I see that in him like I I've been more impressed by him than um than a lot of people that are being projected as first rounders by some people so I, I think he's been great and um last guy I think I want to cover here um is Ty Nelson 
Oh, and, and I'll mix that in with some Joe Verbedek, who's a Habs pick. So these are two guys that play for North Bay. I'm so happy that North Bay's finally decent this year because they were so bad, like, in the last year before the pandemic, or, like, in, in the season that was cut short. Um, and, like, I, I, I lived in North Bay for three years of my life uh, as a very young kid, but still, like, I have a few memories of that time, and I've been back many times, so it... it, it I have, a, I have a connection to that to the city and I guess the team the same in, in, in a sense, but it's just nice to, see, nice to see them playing well. And Ty Nelson and Joe Verbedek are definitely a part of that. Like Verbedek, um, is this like he's a six foot six, but lanky as anything goalie, right? That, that the Habs picked up in the seventh round. That in a pick that I quite liked actually because I think there's some decent upside there. Um, as far as goalie picks go. It was my favorite of the three goalie picks that the Habs have made in the last three drafts. If you put in uh, Jakub Dobesh and um, Nissan Deschau in there, but yeah, he he was he was okay in that game. It was against who was it that against? I forget who he played in that game, but um, he was decent. I I think uh, like North Bay ended up losing, but it was against. Um, I know who this was. Who was this? Um, Was it Barry? No. It wasn't Barry. Oshawa. It was against Oshawa. I should have... Uh, Oshawa. It was against the Oshawa Generals. Um, and Callum Ritchie, who is another who's a player that will likely go pretty high in the 2023 draft, uh, he scored the winner on, on the power play on a shot that Verbedek had no chance on. But he played decently. But Ty Nelson is phenomenal. Like, Ty Nelson is another right defenseman. Uh, he, he was, he's five foot 10, but 196 pounds. He's very sturdy. He's a great passer, uh, very, very intelligent. He, uh, amazing gap control, uh, very smart distributor in the offensive zone. I've been really impressed. Very good skater. I've liked him a lot. Um, I think he's been significantly better, like, than, uh, please tell me no. And I've seen a couple, like, like mock drafts that have them in, like, the same, the same category and like the same couple range of picks, but I, I see a really, really big difference between those two. Um, I, I he's, he's better. He's been better than um, even Noah Warren, who's very close to my heart at this point. Um, but there, there's just a level of dynamism and uh, dominance with Ty Nelson that just isn't there with the uh, with Noah Warren all over the ice. Like, like sure in the defensive zone, yes, but like in transition, in passing, in overall play, Ty Nelson has been phenomenal. Uh, and yeah, I think I'm probably going to end this there. This was meant to be a quick little segment, um, and I, I kind of went overboard, but that's okay because you guys haven't gotten any content basically for uh, a while um, with the podcast. So I, I think it's okay that I'm approaching 50 minutes with this. But um, yeah, anyways, so if you guys want to leave comments or uh, like just contact the podcast or me personally with like recommendations for players to watch or whatever, like you just want to have a chat, whatever it may be, totally welcome to do so. Um, and yeah, like ho- hopefully the podcast is going to be up and running normally again relatively soon but we're definitely going to get some content out for you all no matter what so uh no need to worry about that and yeah i i I hope i hope you're all doing well despite the habs not playing well at all um but yeah i think i think that concludes this episode thank you very much if you listen to the entire thing uh it's not really an episode it's i don't know i'm gonna call it half an episode but yeah this concludes it and I I hope you all enjoyed.